Hello, everybody. Welcome to this week's episode on Fit as a Fiddle. Our guest today is John Wolf. He is a physical therapist, athletic trainer as well, and he's currently completing a PhD in performance psychology. His journey from physical medicine into psychology was inspired by a desire to better understand the influence of the patient-provider relationship. He is a CEO of Patient Success Systems, a company that provides training and consulting to improve clinical outcomes through patient connection and engagement. And I will say that I had the lovely pleasure of working with John most recently um, with the International Academy of Orthopedic Medicine U.S. uh, to create a course that we taught, um, which was geared towards orthopedic clinicians understanding pelvic floor dysfunction. So we did a case study and we taught the course and and I taught some like the special topics and and John actually delved very deeply into um, this whole concept of patient success and patient connection and, and the psychology of helping people better themselves through the work that we do as physical therapists because I think it's, we all understand that it's equally important that you use the information that you receive in a way that actually makes sense. Um, And so I thought that John would be such an amazing guest to talk on the show today because we've got such an eclectic blend of people who listen to the show. And no matter where you come from, understanding how to communicate and making sure that you are doing your work in the best way possible, no matter what field you're in, I think is so important. So John, welcome to the show today. Sneha, thank you for having me on Fit as a Fiddle. Absolutely, my pleasure. So I will let you, I mean, you're doing a doctorate, you're doing a PhD, so Mm -hmm. you have so much knowledge and you are like focused so deeply into this. And I'd love for the listeners and for me to gain a little understanding of what brought you into the space and kind of that transformation of different things that you've done in your career that's led Mm -hmm. you to do what we're doing today and why we're talking to each other today. Yeah, no, it's great. Thank you. The uh, yeah, it's interesting. I was born and bred in orthopedic medicine, generally in sports medicine. So got most of my early experience in treating high level athletes, which gave me also an opportunity to work with high level coaches in the environment of a division one sports medicine program. Um, but then getting out into private practice, I kind of noticed a new. Um, you know, my priority shifted a little bit to understanding, well, how is it that, that any of our patients succeed in this environment? And not just because we're super well trained with the technical aspects of what we do, but there's another component in healthcare specifically that uh, I, you know, I, I just had an intuition about, you know, I would see physical therapists who did a brilliant job of connecting with their patients and inspired their patients. And their, their patients would come back over and over again. And I, but yet their technical skills, you know, their, their technical training wasn't necessarily advanced or, you know, they didn't spend a tremendous amount of money on continuing education for advanced certifications, but yet they did a brilliant job of engaging with patients. And those patients generally tended to stay with the treatment plan. And on the other hand, I worked with many colleagues whose uh, uh, technical training was great, but didn't really connect with patients. So I started to see this idea that that, that oh, while the technical skills are important, there's something else going on. So having focused years and years of all of the advanced training in manual therapy and the differential diagnosis and doing really well with that, is uh, I knew there was something more, which, and you know, the place I had to go to try to find out what it was, was in psychology, because psychology gets this. I mean, they have been studying the effect of the relationship in the therapeutic alliance for, uh, since its inception, Uh, Freud talked about it. You know, it it was, it's really what happens between a patient and provider that starts to, um, that you can really start to explore, well, what happens in the patient's brain and what happens in the provider's brain? I mean, literally in their brain, because because the way I believe that physical therapists are going to get excited about this, maybe even patients, is that there's a lot more than just some ethereal psychology. It's actually neuroscience. Our brains actually uh, feel the the connection that happens between uh, somebody who is helping them succeed at something. So it's really been an interesting journey. And I, I can tell you that the, uh, the whole 
PhD in performance psychology at my age is is quite a thing. I mean, I can't. Uh, it's, I'm enjoying it uh, to some degree, <laughs> but it's also a lot of work. So, um, and the specific topic, and I'll just share because I think it's super interesting. I'm looking at the something called attachment theory, and you may or may not be familiar with it. But attachment theory is a theory that suggests that at a very early age, very early. Um, all humans and other animals as well, develop a way of maintaining a relationship with a caregiver, right? We learn a behavioral pattern of connecting to make sure that we stay connected because we know innately that our success, our survival depends upon our ability to stay connected. And so uh, you can measure this variable. You can uh, measure attachment orientation in uh, adult populations, and you can use it for therapy for those who are kind of interested in the process of therapy. But then there are other attributes, and it's been measured in, in physical, in uh, I'm sorry, psychotherapists and in uh, physicians uh, as some as a variable that also determines uh, whether or not there's a successful therapeutic alliance. So I'm measuring their uh, attachment orientation in physical therapists and uh, another concept called emotion regulation, which is like. Uh, kind of a, the degree to which you can change the trajectory of your emotion, knowing that uh, patients sense our emotions. I mean, they kind of know how we're showing up and the degree to which we're authentic. And, and if we're stressed out, they're going to notice that too. So anyway, there's a lot going on. That is for sure. I love it. Um, I know that I can tell that you could just keep talking about that because I've, I've listened to John talk about it for, was it two hours mm -hmm. times two or time only, it was only one, two hour, right? Mm -hmm. One, right. two hour lecture on, and he had graphics and like Venn diagram kind of looking things and tons of visuals that broke down as clinicians the different elements that go into communication and different elements that go into perception and emotion, like everything he just discussed right now. And um, I think it's incredible that we have this element that com that's coming into um, patient-centered slash evidence-based care because um, it's that biopsychosocial approach that we just like, it's like a buzzword now, which is great because it should, it should be buzzy, but it should also be like grounded and integrated. It shouldn't just be like, no, nah, and I think that the work that you're doing helps ground that mm -hmm. into, right. into like really fortifying it into like, okay, great. Like it's got to do with this, this, and this, but how do you actually apply this? And how can we understand this on a deeper level? Um, and anyone who's listening, like, again, like I said in the beginning, can it be applied to basically everything that you do? Mm -hmm. It's not, it doesn't even just have to be with somebody in healthcare, even it could be somebody who's going in to pitch a business idea and like, how do you show up and how do you communicate effectively? Because every relationship, even if it's not a relationship relationship, it's still a relationship. Like mm -hmm. John and I have a relationship as a podcast guest and as an interviewer right now, right? And hardly interviewing or conversing, but <laughs> you know, I just think it's really important to have these, um, the understanding that as the show title, healing is a relational process. Yes. Um, so why don't we kind of dive into that piece? What, what comes to your mind when you think of healing and how does that integrate into the work that you do? Yeah, that is really, that's a really great question. And it, it certainly dives a little bit deeper into my story. So part of my story is that my wife, Chris, of almost 29 years now has multiple sclerosis. And, you know, MS is just one of those things where, you, you, you just hope there's a cure for. So for many years, we've been uh, circling, uh, searching for, you know, what is the cure to something like this? And it, and it really required me to get a little bit deeper into understanding the difference between curing and healing. Because there's a truth that mm, there's not a cure for MS. So we're on a pathway that is gonna be the full expression of that process. But can there be healing in the process? Even though there's not curing, can there be healing? And so I, I, thought about, I thought about this in the context of my work as a physical therapist. And I said, you know, oftentimes patients come to us with something that is, that is very difficult uh, in, in many ways, either physically or not just the physical part of healing. I'm sorry, the physical part of an affliction, but the impact that the physical affliction has on the rest of your life. 
And that's where oftentimes the real suffering is. People have an experience of losing some sort of function or some ability. And the real consequence is that they aren't the way or who they thought they were anymore. I mean, they, their identity shifts and their relationships in their life shift. And yet someone can come along, maybe a physical therapist or a physician or somebody, and, and can begin to apply what really healing means, which isn't necessarily to cure, but rather to become more whole. I mean, back to the root of the word healing, which is how, or to, uh, and also the same as the root of holy. It's really to become more whole in whatever is. So a, you know, a compassionate healthcare provider, a knowledgeable healthcare provider can show up in a way to actually become a healer. And when I teach this course, I always ask people to raise their hands if they consider themselves a healer. And it's really interesting. Like very few people are willing to, you know, to accept the, the, the name as a healer because it's, you know, the connotations are often with a bunch of, you know, holy roller or something, something, right? Woo stuff. But the truth is, if you, if you really look at kind of more of a different definition of healing about um, that, we can guide people to becoming more whole in who they are and transforming their identity, so to speak, not to something any less, but to something different. You know, we can really be of great service. Um, and, you know, I, I imagine you, I'm sure you apply this uh, to your practice and many listeners apply it to their practice. They just may not be completely aware of how they're applying it or may not be fully intentional about how they're helping the patient create a story or a narrative around their experience and then subsequently guiding them towards some you know, new meaning to the experience so that the suffering drops and that actually sits in a place of understanding like, wow, this is really an interesting uh, forward movement into a process that I would not have under otherwise understood unless you were somehow guiding me through it. Yeah, and do you feel that that healing process always needs to be guided by somebody else? Do you feel like that's essential to the healing is that there's an external source, another human being that helps the guiding process of the healing? Is there self-awareness healing that can be done that is unguided? What's your research and what's your take on that? Yeah, I can't, I can't, I can't back up any, I don't have any research that I I'd be able to just, uh, you know, cite on that. I can say that it, it must be relational. And part of it is um, back to what I think you know, we all start in this world as relational. <laughs> you know, we survive because we have relationships. And, you know, most of our early, early uh, formation is, is in a process of relating with somebody, our parents or some, someone who guides us through it. So I think that because we're relational animals, that it, re it does require at some level, somebody who may or may not be intentional about it, frankly, and it could just be someone important in our lives, right? Who has offered some level of advice or some perspective, who has contextualized our experience in some way. And that context has allowed us to kind of step into the next level. Now, with regards to healthcare providers, you know, we're just in such a unique opportunity, a unique environment, because patients, they come to us in pain, not just physical pain, but also a lot of other kinds of pain as, a re as it relates to the suffering of not being who they were or how, not sure how to navigate the experience that they're having. And that doesn't mean we all have to be psychologists or psychotherapists, frankly. We have to be compassionate, caring people who help them contextualize their experience, which for somebody's brain helps to complete the story. It, it completes the gap in the narrative that minimizes the chances that they're gonna catastrophize about the worst case scenario, or that they won't have the resources necessary you know, the, the, the internal resources necessary to kind of meet the challenge. Yeah. So um, yes, the answer is, I do believe strongly that it is a relational process. So what do you feel like you have, what, what would you have to say for the practitioner who goes, I have two backs an ankle and a shoulder today? You oh, know exactly what I'm talking about, right? Yeah, right. <laughs> oh, good. They're so, looking at their patient schedule and they don't yeah, right. read the names. They I just know. say, oh, I got two backs. I got, I got the ankle. 
Oh, mm-hmm. I got this. Yeah. They look at the, what, 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 what do you have to say about that? <laughs> you know, yeah, I'll be, you know, it's, it's, uh, it makes sense to me. It, it makes sense to me because if we're a physical therapist, right? If our jam, if our focus is truly on treating the physical thing, if you, if you think about it, we went to school to learn the physical stuff and our technical training, all of most, all of our formation is really focused on the biomechanics of that. And then in and the, and the biochemistry of that and how this thing can get inflamed. I mean, that's a, a large part of how we approach a patient because there come patients come to us wanting their, their thing treated. So I, I totally get that. And I think it's, I, I'm not gonna say it's bad. I'm just gonna say it's incomplete. You know, I think that the research is starting to point clearly now towards the idea that, yes, the things that you do to patients are going to help them, right? The, the better you are at being able to position the ankle for that perfect mobilization to improve, you know, subtalar joint motion, good, do that stuff really well. However, part of the treatment effect, part of the treatment effect is going to go beyond just the mechanical thing that you can reestablish with somebody. It's also going to um, include the degree to which the patient trusts in the process, believes that they're going to stay with it, does what they're committed to do in terms of a therapeutic encounter as a process of getting better. Um, Some would suggest that it's going to facilitate the placebo effects you know, the, the neurochemistry that results in the expectations that trips a lot of this neurochemistry in towards what uh, the patient appreciating of what would be a positive outcome. So uh, I think what happens, a lot of us show up, Sneha, with a, with a toolbox that's, that's, that's really only half full, right? We learn a lot of skills, but um, we, we fail to recognize that that's only half the toolbox. The rest of the toolbox is actually how we show up with the patient and facilitate and inspire a lot of what happens. I'll, I'll summarize my, my answer there with a, with a quote that I often use is that the best surgeon in the world cannot heal a cut. If you think about it, a, a, a great surgeon will approximate the wound. They'll sew things together. But who does the healing? It's not the surgeon, and and ex- except to the extent that they can inspire a healing response in the patient. So I think oftentimes our job is to create the best possible environment for this healing to happen. That's so interesting. I have a little story to share, and maybe this has everything to do with what we're talking about, or maybe only a little bit. But I remember there was this little shift during the pandemic where I was seeing a whole bunch of people in person, and it was really busy. I, I did I do house calls. My days are very long and I'm running around and there's so much I give to my patients and I don't take too much, but um, then the pandemic happened and I remember everything shift to virtual. And then suddenly I had this time because I'm not commuting to my patients. Um, and so I had this like little pockets of space that I had in between. And then suddenly I was like, oh, what can I do with this extra time for my patients? And so I started doing this thing where for each patient, because also I wasn't there in person, I was like, I don't know what's going to happen to the quality of care. I'm a physical therapist. There's a word physical in front of it. There's so, I mean, now we have such a big change in the way that we see about see telehealth and all that stuff. It's, it's transformed so much, but when it first started, I was like, I have no idea. I'm going to fail at doing this. I don't know if this is going to work. And, and, and pelvic floor too, on top of that. Yeah. So I started doing this thing where I had each patient's name on a Google doc that I, that was shared with them with all of their goals and color coded with like the purpose of this goal or the purpose of achieving this piece and like steps that we were going to do to achieve the thing. It was like I cannot tell you how thorough it was. Mm -hmm. And um, I had like for the first time, this patient who had a third degree prolapse, a really bad hernia, immediately postpartum, a diastasis recti, can't even like walk Mm pain-free. And then suddenly she was like running in two months. And I was like, what is happening right now? And she was like, I just followed the thing. Like we talked about it. Like you pushed me to do it. And it was like this framework that she was, I like 
gave her the evidence behind it. And I showed her, this is what we need to do and, and gave her expectations and how it's not going to be one line trajectory. I like to talk to her so much. And then I look back on it. I'm like, I wish I had the time to do that with every patient now, <laughs> but it was just the sudden, like, I think a uh, confirmation that if you just really focus, it doesn't have to be outside of your treatment sessions, but while you're with the patient, you just give like every thing you can, which is like what I strive for that. And any patient who's listening to this, maybe you feel that way, but I try. So you give 110%, 100,000%, you may actually make a difference. And that's what we're going for. We may actually make a difference. I don't know if you have any reaction to that or if it has nothing to do with the work that you're doing, but I just yeah. thought I would share that story. <laughs> but, you know, yeah, I, I like what you're saying. And right now, if, you know, even listeners can hear your enthusiasm, right? And I think when when we show up as, as healthcare providers with a certain amount of passion and enthusiasm, that's noticed, Patients kind of go that you're checked in, which is opposite of checked out. They sense that you're engaged. So part of the inspire, you know, being inspired by somebody is somebody who shows up with, uh, with a certain amount of passion for it. And it's obvious you have a lot of passion about your work. Um, and you also illustrated super well that the system, the healthcare system is not necessarily designed to support the provider in being super passionate and having a lot of time with patients. So we're really in a in a bit of a jam to figure out. I mean, yeah, we would love everyone to show up, go, yeah, we're totally into every single patient. But you know, when you've got 12, 14, 16 patients on your schedule every day, you know, how do you muster, how do you get a rhythm and a flow to and a mindset, right, to connect? And how do you apportion the right amount of energy? towards connecting and this the right amount of energy at the same time towards um so the technical skills because the the relational brain and part of what i teach in in my course is that the social brain competes with the analytical brain there's you know most of our our social our cognitive resources are spent in examining and understanding how relationships are going if you think about it, during downtime, we're often intrigued by relational issues, not solving math problems or something else. So it's so we actually have to um, we have to kind of balance this focus when we're with patients. Now, and my sense is that patients know this; they they feel like, "Wow, you really are connecting with me." And I think one way to to help healthcare providers understand this process is what I'm trying to do is reframe their experience to, I wonder if we could just picture ourselves as uh, guides, not, not as a person in there to fix somebody. And to the extent that you are committed to helping this, this uh, lady that you mentioned, part of what you wanted to do is outline a map for her to a destination. Now, if, if you imagine being a patient, you're lost. Oftentimes you don't know what's going on. You're, you're scared. You're you're trying to get someplace, you are where you are, but you don't want to stay there. Wouldn't it be nice to have a guide, someone to guide you out of the process on a journey from someplace to someplace else? I think it's important to frame it that way because everybody knows that a journey takes time and it takes energy. It's just not something that happens. We start someplace and we're going to get someplace. And you, what you did when, when you had the time and took the time is you outlined a map to a destination. So that patient's brain is like, oh, I know how to get someplace if I got a map. Now, it, that's not always easy to do. And sometimes our maps need to be kind of uncovered and evolved as we work with a patient, right? There's a lot of things that need to be determined. And I would also suggest that it wasn't just, you know, the, the technical things that you provided her, but it was also a lot of inspiration and specific explanation as time went. So, yeah, that's a, that's a pretty cool story story that you shared because we're all struggling to do a better job and getting patient success. Yeah, I think we're all trying. And I think that at least the work that you're doing is helping people understand how to do that a little bit better. So mm -hmm. on that note, tell us a little bit about patient success systems and tell us about the work specifically that you do and the offerings that you have for listeners yeah. who are interested, healthcare professionals or otherwise. Right. Well, it was founded, uh, I was working with two other um, mental health care providers who, who also saw how there is an important 
kind of a missing gap in physical therapy. And this is over 10 years ago. And uh, from that collaborated and worked carefully to create what would be some of the basic skills that a physical therapist could appreciate from the perspective of a psychotherapist. Like what can we learn from psychology that can be translated and excuse me, easily, easily implemented in, in the process of patient engagement. So over the past 10 years, uh, I've been evolving the content in the course. It was at one point called uh, the course that I would teach. It's kind of like a two-day continuing education course. And I taught it oftentimes through the academy that you mentioned earlier, um, where you know, we would provide some of the didactic information, some of the basics, why it works, how it works, and then a hands-on skills. Like imagine being in a room and we break out into groups and you actually feel what it feels like to experience a certain shift in either in mindset or a specific language phrase, um, what it feels like to execute some of these specific skills like uh, pacing and synchrony and uh, open language versus closed language. So a lot of communication skills, but it's not specifically only communication skills. So right now I've taken the, a lot of the, um, how would you say the didactic part or the kind of the neuroscience, the, the basics and uh, just finishing up filming the, that course for an online offering. And then, and then still going out to teach organizations because a lot of companies right now want to do a better job of engaging patients. And true to form, uh, a lot of the new research that's coming out on the importance of this is behind clinical practice. So I'm trying to accelerate that conversion to clinical practice by not only helping people understand the importance of it, but also how to do it. Yeah. And if somebody listening who wants to learn more specifically about integrating this into their company or talking about this from a personal level, um, where do they go to find that information? Yeah, to uh, patientsuccesssystems.com. So that is a uh, patientsuccesssystems.com. Yeah, and you can email me there. There's, I, I'm sure there's plenty of links to get a hold, get a hold of me, and some ways to uh, uh, preview some of what the content looks like and the benefits, the practical benefits that many therapists enjoy and, and organizations enjoy is that what we know is that if we can, if patients are able to stay engaged, if they feel the degree of connection with their provider, uh, they're more likely to stick with a plan of care. And mm -hmm. if they can do that, their clinical outcomes are gonna get better. So it's not the best you know, ankle mobilization that gets better cl clinical outcomes, it's a combination of good ankle mobilization and the relationship. Yeah. So we also see that cancellation no-shows drop. We also see that generally provider um, satisfaction increases, like they just feel a little bit less burdened uh, and more skillful in the ability to deal with some of the emotional things that come with being a healthcare provider and uh, generally a more satisfied patients and satisfied patients are more likely to tell their friends and family members that, that, uh, Hey, wow, that was a great experience. So yeah, putting it all together there. Great. I'll drop the website on the show links for anybody who wants to go and check out John's work. John, are there any last words you'd like to leave our listeners with today? No, I, I would, I would just echo what you said earlier. It's great working with you on that, uh, that course. Um, and uh, it's great to have perspectives of colleagues who are committed and dedicated to learning and teaching. And, um, you know, it's also great to be getting the word out there. So I just thank you for having this podcast and letting people know. Absolutely. And we'll have you on again one day when there's even more information to be out there. Sounds good. <laughs>